Uh, my name is Dr. Mishra. I'm here at Raritan Bay. I'm chair of the Department of Psychiatry. And uh, uh, as you can see, uh, Kaylin has put an older picture of me with a lot more hair than I have now, but I'm the same person depicted there. So with this, I'll move on to the next slide. And what we will do, it is uh, going to be a simple uh, presentation about uh, covering what conditions, behavioral health conditions as uh, you know, first responder, you may be uh, encountering in the uh, in the field. Number one, and then maybe some strategies we will discuss that how you can successfully deal with uh, behavioral health patients. I Me, mean, I will say this thing that everybody hears news, and every so often, I think more often than it should, we hear that a mentally ill, Ill person was shot by the police officers. This, that, another. You know, um, so bad outcomes are plentiful, and we want that to stop. And of course, we understand that uh, what stress our first responders respond to situation in, uh, and uh, at times reflexes take over. But still, if we can do something to improve the outcomes of these encounters in the field by our first responders, and first responders are not only the police officers. Uh, but they are also, I'm including in this, uh, the EMS worker and whatnot. So all those, what we can do to have a better outcome for barely uh, disturbed patient. So that will be second part of our talk. And next part will be that uh, the first responders, simply because of the nature of their job, have more uh, you know, likelihood of having behavioral health disorders uh, and conditions. So I will be discussing a little bit of that so that you can take steps to minimize the um, poor outcome related to developing behavioral health disorders and uh, conditions. So we'll discuss that a little bit. And lastly, I will tell you that what is available at Raritan Bay Medical Center and Old Bridge Medical Center. And it is for both, you know, for your patients, as well as if you have yourself any problem uh, which needs to be addressed, uh, you can avail the services here. So this will be the broad um, description of uh, our talk today. So first thing I will talk about that we always hear, and I get this question uh, repeatedly, that what is mental illness and then what is behavioral health? Um, are they interchangeable? To some extent they are, but not completely. So let's see what is a mental illness. And I think that what I have put there is a pretty uh, good description uh, of, of summarizing what mental illness is. It's a biological disorder which has psychosocial context. So mental illnesses do not develop in psychosocial vacuum, you know, because psychosocial factors are equally important. But we should not forget that these are biological disorders which is developing in a certain psychosocial context. And what uh, these mental illnesses can uh, present with, they can present with changes in mood, changes in thinking, changes in perception, how we see the world around, how we perceive the world around us, and changes in our behavior. So this is what a mental illness um, presentation. Now then what is behavioral health? Second question may be that. So behavioral health is basically, um, Mental illness and substance abuse condition combined together uh, is uh, combined together is behavioral health domain. And generally, when I'm talking to our uh, nurses, our residents, and fellows, I talk about that any abnormal behavior is the uh, domain of uh, behavioral health professionals. So. Those days are gone when we used to consider us as a psychiatrist or psychologist uh, with pure mental illness um, bias. Here, nowadays, the concept is that we all are behavioral health professionals. So any abnormal or disordered behavior uh, falls within our domain. So this is the difference in these two terms, which you will hear uh, repeatedly in, in your professional life. Now, this slide, I put a few facts together about mental illness because there are certain, uh, you know, preconceived notions we all have. And 
majority of people I talk to, lay people I'm talking about, they have this notion as if most of the crimes are committed by people with mental illness. And actually, media does give flames, uh, no, um, the, the air to these flames, uh, that as if mentally ill are committing crimes. Actually, the, the facts are exactly the opposite. People with mental illness are about two and a half times more likely to be victim of the crime rather than perpetrating the crime themselves. So one has to remember this fact that although you will hear in media a lot, you will um, have this conversation every in every uh, nook and corner that as if mentally ill people are committing crime. Actually, I'm not able to get the reference. Otherwise, I would have talked about it. There was a study in which it was really um, calculated that even if we completely took care of all the mental illness in this world, still 90 plus percent of the crimes will continue to happen. So that is the state that uh, correlation between mental illness and, um, and, and criminality, so to say. Uh, they are actually more victim rather than perpetrators of crime. On the other hand, this is also a fact, everybody knows it, that prison populations have high percentage of mentally ill. And at some point, somebody had mentioned that Los, Los Angeles Correctional System is the biggest psychiatric hospital or uh, behavioral health facility in whole United States because so many mentally ill people who belong to uh, psychiatric uh, um, hospitals and services, they end up in prison. Uh, so that is a fact also. One fact which is very clear, and I think everybody should know that the violence risk increases when mental illness is combined with uh, a uh, substance use disorder, what we call co-occurring disorder, or maybe uh, um, sometimes we call dual diagnosis. In those situations, there is increased uh, risk of violence. And similar uh, <clears throat> uh, statistics is there for when a mentally ill person comes in uh, has and has an encounter with a first responder or law enforcement, there the risk of um, violence is higher. So these are some facts and myths about uh, mental illness, which I wanted to put there. Now, next, this slide, the next three slides, actually, I will talk about general prevalence, meaning how common these conditions are in the community. And that will give you an idea that uh, what percentage of population suffers from behavioral health disorders, mental illness, and whatnot. So if you look at this slide, it comes directly from uh, National Institute of Health, NIH, most reliable source. And all these three slides are from 2022 or 2023. So pretty recent statistics. And if you see that uh, anxiety disorders are the most common conditions, about 19 plus percent of people uh, in the United States have anxiety disorders. Second most common is uh, major depression, 8.3%, and list goes on like this. Psychotic disorders, schizophrenia and all, fall below 1%, and uh, it would have been here if um, there was more space. So you can see that these are the most common psychiatric or mental illness issues in the community, and in that frequency, you may, be, uh, you may encounter them uh, as first responder. Although I will say this thing, that anxiety disorder patients generally, uh, you probably will not be seeing in community situations because they themselves bring them, they themselves bring themselves to hospitals rather than having a crisis at home resulting in being called, uh, first responders being called. So you can easily say that about 20% plus population, I mean, every one in five individual uh, or little more than that has a mental illness. This slide talks about the alcohol use in our community. You know, So if you look at, I will go by this first, about 10.6% of the population, about 29 and a half million people have diagnosable alcohol use problem. Meaning as per our diagnostic manual, they can be diagnosed with alcohol use disorder, which is a staggering number, about 30 million people, 10% of the people, while about 62.3% admit that they have used alcohol in the past year. 
look at this, that emergency room visit purely for alcohol reason, about one and three quarters million people visit emergency room simply because of alcohol related emer uh, emergencies. And this many people, 150,000, approximately 141,000 people die because of alcohol. So this number is very important. As you saw that about 20, 22% of the people will have, 25% of the people will have mental illness. 10% of them uh, have, uh, you know, alcohol use disorder. And then we come to the next slide, uh, which is drug use um, in, in our population. And the, there are three lines you will see. Just focus on last year use, which is the middle line, light green. And you will see that marijuana use was reported by 17.9% of the people, cocaine use by 1.9, and so on and so forth. Heroin use uh, um, is reported here 0.3%, and we all know that what devastation it has caused in, uh, in, in past few years. So if you look at these three slides, you will know that how many um, times you are likely to encounter um, a person who is who has behavioral health disorder, so to say, um, very common. So uh, meaning one every four person is carrying um, a, a, a condition which has either substance use problem or maybe a psychiatric disorder. And one has to be aware of the extent of the problem. Let's talk about that what as first responders, uh, people encounter uh, most in the community. Because say in this case, I'm saying first responders are like EMS is called for help or um, firefighters are called for certain things uh, which might have been done by a disordered person or uh, law, law enforcement officers are called for uh, disruption in the community. So as I said, uh, anxiety disorders, uh, an obsessive compulsive disorder will not result in those types of calls. These are the conditions which will uh, result in um, first responders being called. Psychotic disorders uh, get the most, uh, you know, uh, press, so to say, uh, because they are most dramatic. And from psychotic, by psychotic disorder, we mean schizophrenia, drug-induced psychosis and whatnot. But Bipolar disorder and depression can also present equally dramatically, and so does intoxication, as we all know. So these are four conditions. We'll go in a little more details to identify them and how to best respond in the community if we are called to uh, uh, resolve a situation in the community. So let's first of all talk about psychotic vision. So what is psychosis? I think we need to know what is the definition? Psychosis basically means that when somebody is out of touch with reality, meaning he's acting in a manner which shows that he is not reality oriented. Uh, he's perceiving the world around him, which is unrealistic. And that feeling of unreality comes in the form of delusions, hallucinations, disorganizations of behavior and speech. So you may find a person who has false beliefs, uh, which cannot be shaken. The person may be having experiences like hallucinations. Um, and same way, the patient may present with disorganized speech that you cannot make head and tail out of uh, what the person is saying or behaving in such disorganized fashion, causing disruption in the community uh, and putting people in danger or, or himself in danger. So this is general definition. That person acts in a manner uh, where... He's out of touch uh, with what is going around in the world around him. And psychosis as a symptom can present in schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, depression, substance use disorder, dementia. So psychosis is a set of symptoms, while different conditions can lead to uh, presentation of psychosis. Now here I'm going a little bit more details because you will see patients uh, who will be either experiencing hallucinations or delusions. So like some uh, hallucinations are different perceptual modalities, like we have different uh, modalities by which we perceive the world, like hearing is auditory uh, domain, 
So people may be having hallucination in uh, auditory domain. Um, and, and that generally is the most common type of hallucinations that people report that they are hearing voices. And they you may hear somebody saying that the people are talking about me when you know that there is nobody around. Same way, it can happen in visual domain when people will start seeing things which other people don't see or pe things which don't exist. So that is another experience you may come across. Tactile meaning sense of touch. You can have uh, hallucination in those in, in that domain. And generally people report uh, perceptions in, in, in touch form, like they may feel that the bugs crawling all over their body or their uh, head or whatnot. Uh, and this happens more commonly in drug-induced conditions. And olfactory means sense of smell uh, that patients may report hallucination in uh, smell category, like smelling blood when there's really no reason for them to smell that. So these are the extra uh, perception without any stimulus which patient may report. Same way, patient may present with fixed beliefs, which are not true. And you know they're not true, but they are convinced. Like paranoid, that people are reading my thoughts, they may report, or FBI is tapping my phone. So that, that is basically a uh, persecutory delusion. A uh, patient may present in the form of grandiose delusions, like I'm God, I can communicate with aliens, I can read your mind, whatnot. Another set of uh, uh, delusion is ideas or delusions of reference in which people start perceiving the world, normal happenings in the world as if somehow they are related to them. Like the example written there, television shows are about me. Everyone is looking at me and talking about me. So these are some common symptoms patient may present, a psychotic patient may present. Now, as a first responder, how should you respond to, meaning what strategy should you should adopt so that you can have a better outcome? So first thing is that psychotic person does not like surprises because they are already um, overwhelmed with the experience as, it, as we just saw. So it's always better that you inform them before you start acting, you know, that, um, that the, as, and I'm not going to read every sentence written there, but it says that I'm going to check you for weapons. If you inform them and start checking, you probably will have better um, outcome compared to if you just suddenly barged in and start moving towards him with a stance of checking him uh, or holding him down or whatnot, because that will be perceived as threatening. So, uh, simple step like inform before uh, acting. Same way, it is always better not to become part of their delusions or, or agree with their delusion, but try to connect with the patient and patient's emotions and feelings. You know, like the example given here that you are empathizing with the patient that how difficult it may be uh, to see him, God and devil fighting. You know, so here you are trying to empathize with the patient or connect with the patient. Um, and share the experience rather than being judgmental about his experience. And same way, if you can, you should offer choices. You know, if you have any choices, then patient feels empowered and may like and will likely not act out. So, if you are seeing a psychotic patient, now you know what symptoms they present with, and what will be the best strategy to deal with uh, an acutely psychotic patient. <clears throat> Let's go to the next common uh, disorder which you may be called to attend to and which is bipolar disorder. A bipolar disorder, as compared to uh, psychotic disorder, it is a mood disorder. And <clears throat> mood disorders uh, can be the major depression, which we'll see next, but bi and bipolar disorder. These are most common one and most serious of mood disorders. So bipolar disorder can present with extreme mood swings, meaning sometimes people may be very high in mood, which is mania. Other times they will be very low uh, uh, mood uh, state, which is depression. And mood can cycle up and down. It sometimes can cycle very rapidly, but generally cycling is not that rapid. Just so that you know that a rapid cycler is called somebody who has had four cycles in a 12-month period of time. So 
sometimes people will say that oh uh, that i my mood changes every hour that is not the change what we see in bipolar disorder because that is not that frequent a change it may be normal changes in the emotional emotional state but uh, just for the matter of this discussion moods can cycle up and down and they may not follow any pattern somebody may continue to have manic 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 episode somebody may have depressed manic manic depressed whichever pattern can follow now as we discussed earlier it can also present with psychosis first responders will generally encounter either a severely manic patient or severe, severely depressed patient with uh, suicidal intent now as a first responder suppose you are in the community <clears throat> what should be your strategy uh, to deal with a bipolar disorder patient? Now, by nature of the illness, bipolar disorder patients are very argumentative, you know, overly talkative, and try to take control of the situation because of their grandiosity. So, strategy should be that you remain calm and not get caught on into their uh, high energy state. Uh, so, that is one thing. And try to close the loop of the conversation by asking a closed-ended question which requires yes or no answer and try to contain the conversation. Otherwise, it is an endless talk they can continue to have. You should, as we discussed, they are very argument, argumentative, so you should not argue with them at all. Try to provide a reassuring presence because they, although they are acting that way, at some level they are aware that uh, they are out of control um, and they would like uh, somebody to latch on to somebody who's calm and reassuring and who can provide sense of safety and structure. So underneath, you can connect with that person who is presenting with very high energy, very argumentative um, stance. Um, if you provide these solid structure, then you may have better success dealing with them. Now let's talk about the third more common, most common condition you may be called upon is depression. And uh, depression again, uh, as it is there that more women have than men. Depression is not limited to any particular age. You can find it from children to very elderly people. And it is also an ep episodic condition, but these episodes last weeks to months. You know, they don't rapidly change. Um, if you are coming across new mothers, then we should always be careful about evaluating postpartum depression. Just one thing I want everybody to understand that depression is very treatable, you know, and uh, one should not just accept the condition uh, because treatment is, effective treatment is available. Now, what are some common symptoms of uh, depression? These are all listed here. Basically, person has difficulty with sleep, appetite, not able to enjoy life, very poor motivation and energy, and has thoughts of death and suicide. So that is what basically the presentation of depression is. Now, as a first responder, if you encounter a depressed patient, what should you do? You know, how do you deal with the patient? Basically, most important thing is that you really have to assess the suicidal intent plan or means, you know, because it is not unknown that uh, patients have tried to commit suicide right in front of the uh, people who are trying to help. So one has to determine that what is exactly the intent or plan. And you should um, ask direct and specific questions so that you know the actual intent of the person and act accordingly. Another thing which I would put in front of you, which can become problematic because Depressed people have very slow psychomotor response. You know, they, their thinking is slowed, their movements are slowed. And sometimes police officer or firefighter or anybody else, many, they may think that, oh my God, this person is uh, not showing any respect to what we are doing or what we are re requesting, and he's not cooperative. But that is not the case, generally. Gen a truly depressed person is inherently keep incapable of responding fast or normally as we do. So do not take it as sign of disrespect or lack of cooperation and act impulsively based on that understanding. 
Um, your goal basically is uh, to transfer this patient to a treatment facility um, as quickly as possible. Now, the fourth and last condition, which uh, you may come across, and uh, almost all of us have seen this, so I will not spend too much time reading this, but intoxicated person. And I'm taking a prototypical example of an alcohol use disorder patient, but intoxication can be from various other substances also. Um, so speech, balance, coordination, behavior, and physical appearance. I'm not going to read all of them because they are there. You can um, just go over. But these five things will give you an indication that patient appears to be um, intoxicated. And when somebody is intoxicated, our first and foremost strategy is that person remains safe while he's intoxicated. So a few things I wanted to put there so that we all uh, have better understanding of uh, intoxicated person. First of all, intoxication has stages, you know, uh, one should be aware of that starts with subclinical where person doesn't appear intoxicated. Then it goes to a euphoria. Basically, these stages I'm describing in the context of alcohol use. Then patient person becomes euphoric. That, oh, everything is wonderful, hunky dory, this, that, another. And then he goes into a phase of excitement. Then start behaving in such a manner that euphoria turns into excitement and person becomes hyperactive and excitable. Further stage is confusion. And then it goes on to stuporous patient, comat comatose patient, and ultimately even death can occur with if toxic alcohol levels are consumed. So you may be called upon, uh, basically you probably will be called upon in later stages of intoxication, you know, and uh, from excitement onwards. So one should be aware that uh, which stage we are in. Now, safety is the concern, which again is listed. I'm not going to read every one of them. Uh, the only thing I will say is that don't provoke a fight by arguing with the person or making fun of the person, even in intoxicated states, and they understand. So if we argue or if they see that we are kind of disrespectful to them, it is likely that intoxicated person will get into fight. And uh, same in the same vein, you know, uh, a, an intoxicated person is not receptive to any counseling and, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the giving an education at that time. So that is not the goal, you know, uh, because that is only going to uh, irritate the patient more. At this time, your goal is to keep him safe and take him to the right place where he can be um, kept safe and treated if needed. Um, Counseling and all that can come later when he's not um, not in an intoxicated state and more receptive. Then I will, and you might have heard these acronyms, uh, like I'm talking about leaps here. I got it from somewhere. You may have heard many others. But how to de-escalate a situation when person is agitated? Uh, with I'm talking about mentally ill and uh, behaviorally disordered patient listening to them, empathizing with them as we discuss, asking questions, and then paraphrasing that we understood them correctly, uh, that that is what they want to say, and summarizing to them what we want to, what we understood about them and what we want to do will de-escalate the situation most likely. Not always, but we'll have better understanding of the situation. Now, once we talked about, this is very important, I would like really to emphasize this part because I really think it is very important for us to know that behaviors, behaviors again develop because of uh, lifelong experiences, current circumstances, how uh, your genetics are and, and, and sim in similar way, what is your predilection to get mental uh, illnesses? So various things affect your behavior, how you behave in a certain manner. Now, one of this is the most important factor about the behavior, understanding behavior is that adverse childhood experience, and there are multiple studies which have shown this thing, that if somebody has been exposed to adverse childhood experience, it can result in really 
devastating consequences like social, emotional, and cognitive impairment, adoption of health risk behavior such as drinking, uh, smoking, using drugs, whatnot, uh, disease, disability, and social problems, and even early death. So a person who as a child has been abused and has uh, uh, experienced trauma is exposed to all these, I mean, is, is likely to develop these things. So we had to see a dis behaviorally disordered person with this lens that who knows what this person has gone through, which may be the reason for him acting in certain manner. Now, uh, so that was one part. That Remember one thing, that adverse childhood experiences have a long-lasting impact on patient's personality, any person's personal, not patient, any person's personality and behaviors. Second thing is that why, why it is so, and why it is so is right on this slide, that when somebody is exposed to tra chronic trauma, uh, certain changes happen in the brain. And this slide is very important to, for us to uh, digest, so to say. What happens is that when you are uh, exposed to chronic trauma, you are not able to shut down your emergency response system. So think uh, 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 yourself, you are going on a trail and you see a mountain lion uh, right there. So what will be your body's response? That kind of response uh, is not shut down even after you are out of this experience. Uh, that is the case with people who have suffered chronic um, uh, chronic trauma, like abuse during childhood and whatnot. So these people are in a perpetual state of hyper arousal. So, uh, and in the brain, what is happening is that executive function, like which is the frontal lobe function, meaning higher order function, and limbic system, which is your emotional response, uh, the part of the brain which is responsible for emotional response, they shut down. So now you are at a very basic level of survival mode, you know, and that is why you are in hyper aroused state. Your body is preparing for fighting or fleeing or even getting ready for injury of some kind, and that is why the person behaves in uh, aggressive or violent or volatile manner. So that is what chronic trauma per, uh, person does, uh, the, the person who has been exposed to chronic trauma. Generally speaking, people will have trauma, they will be able to shut it off after some time, but the person who has been exposed repeatedly uh, cannot do it, and that is why um, they are in perpetual state of hyper arousal, and as if they are being attacked, and therefore they are ready to attack in response. Now, why I'm talking so much about that, it is much better for you to be informed about the trauma and role so that you can understand better and react to this person who is in front of you uh, and understand the behaviors. So first of all, you have to recognize that there is high level of trauma uh, among people we serve. You as first responder, I as uh, psychiatrist, we are, uh, mainly serving people who have had high level of trauma uh, in their lifetime. Now, as we discussed, that uh, adverse childhood experiences play uh, a significant role in the lives of trauma survivor. And this line I really want everybody to take home, that the behaviors you are observing may have protected these people in the past. Meaning, think of a, think of a child being beaten up there may have been a time when this child stood up for himself and stopped the abuser. And that is how he protected himself. So his behavior, what he's showing now, of course it is dysfunctional behavior, but he's acting in this manner because this was the behavior he knows protected him in the past. So that is why he's there. And patient should be seen as a whole, not just the behavior, uh, what he's showing. Now I'm going to move a little faster because uh, we have, want to have a few minutes for the question and answer. So best thing is that now you know that what is the role of uh, adverse childhood experiences. You know that majority of people we serve have been exposed to chronic trauma and 
their brains have been altered in certain manner that they are always in the fight or flight mode, uh, hyper aroused, and the behaviors they are showing may have protected them in the past. So considering all that, you probably will be able to make more sense of a person who is acting in a disordered manner, no doubt, but at least you will have better understanding. And if you know this, then you have greater chance of positive outcome in your encounter with the, with the person. Now, this slide I put there because whenever you are thinking, as I'm, I'm talking now plainly about law enforcement people, when they come across situations in the community, then always think of something other than jail if you can. You know, I meaning I'm not, I'm not going to say that uh, everybody, nobody should go to jail. I meaning there are people who are criminals who are who belong uh, in the law enforcement area. But if drug and alcohol is a problem and you can locate a rehab or detox which will accept the patient, if mental illness is a problem and you can locate a place where you can take the person, you should always do it because it is good for the person uh, rather than being in jail. So our two parts are complete. So I'm coming to the third part now, which is behavioral health concerns in the first responders themselves simply because the tasks they are dealing with are so traumatic that they are bound to develop the psychiatric and behavioral health issues more. And my suggestion is that we should be more informed about this, that we are, we may, we may be tough guys, but we still can have these problems so that you can seek help and prevent the poor outcomes like right here. Uh, in the United States, about 125 to 300 police officers commit suicide every year. 300 police officers uh, commit suicide. It's a big number. Almost a, a police officer is committing suicide every day, uh, which, is, which is kind of shameful. Same way, if you look at the statistics here, that th generally speaking, as we saw, about 20% of the general population has behavioral problem, but in first responders, this number goes to 30%. You are approximately 50% more likely to develop behavioral health concern. And the one thing which you should uh, pay attention to that what type of uh, behavioral health concerns our first responders develop, depression, stress, post-traumatic stress disorder, suicidality, and substance use. These are the most common uh, mental health and behavioral health conditions which uh, first responders develop. Now, what are the risk factors for a first responder to develop uh, behavioral health problems? First and foremost, this, in this slide I will go one by one because this is important because this, these things should be considered uh, in first, uh, first responders training uh, and occupation to take care of these issues. So inadequate training and unrealistic expectation from the first responder. These are the risk factors for developing behavioral health problems. If somebody has had personal history of trauma and loss uh, before they become first responder and start getting exposed, that is a risk factor. Now, suppose you are responding to a disaster and you are working very closely to the epicenter of this disaster, you're likely to develop behavioral health issues later on, especially your working long hours there, and you are exposed to serious injuries and dead bodies. This definitely is going to increase your risk. Same way, if you do not feel yourself safe in a rescue situation, yourself uh, perceive that danger exists to you yourself, or you get, being, you get harmed or injured during your rescue work, you are likely to develop aftermath of uh, uh, this 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 work basically respond first responder now sometimes when you go through meaning first responders who are exposed to all this trauma anyway and they go through life events such as divorce breakups uh, they that can increase the risk of their uh, developing behavioral health problems and so is avoidant coping style and what i mean by the avoidant coping style that sometimes people will consider themselves too macho, too manly, that, oh, I don't need to discuss this. Uh, that is called avoidant coping, that you don't want to discuss your, discuss your emotions. 
which can actually later grow into um, behavioral health issues later on. Uh, so always avoid this avoidant uh, coping mechanisms. Now, what actually protects uh, our first responders from developing behavioral health problems? These are the factors. And again, we'll go one by one. Number one is, if you have been on the job for a long period of time, uh, that is a, um, a protecting factor. Right? It, it does help situations. So does specialized training uh, in your field. Same way, if you are assured in your personal or your team's capability uh, to handle the day-to-day -day work in your field, then it is considered as, as a protection because these, these first responders who have this assurance in their capability or team's capability uh, have less chance of developing um, behavioral health problems. Same way, again, resilience is something which is uh, basically defined here. You know that uh, the people who successfully adapt to the stress stressors and maintain their psychological well-being, that those people are, people are called resilient. That these, this is inherent, but it is not always. Meaning with training, you can develop uh, resilience. And so somebody who has higher level of resilience is less likely to be affected by these trauma which first responders go through. Now, if you feel supported by your organization, then you are less likely to develop uh, behavioral health problems. And same way, if there is availability of mental health help and you avail that, that can be very protective. So these are the things which we should do to avoid any long-term consequences of our first responders' work. So this was my uh, third portion, which I wanted to talk about, that what first responders can themselves be uh, exposed, uh, can, can have, you know, experience behavioral health problems. Now this brings to our last part of uh, the talk, that for your patients and for you yourself, uh, we have excellent behavioral health resources at RBMC, which is Raritan Bay Medical Center, and OBMC, which is Old Bridge Medical Center. In the next two or three slides, I will discuss those. So what do we have? And recently, uh, meaning in past eight years or so, we have been part of Agnesac Meridian Health. And since then, our behavioral health department has grown leaps and bounds. You know, So we are a big behavioral health presence at RBMC. So I'm just listing a few things here, not listing a few things. It's almost everything which we have here I'm going to tell you about. First of all, now at this point of time, we had two inpatient units, which have a total of 81 beds, uh, psychiatric beds, so to say. And all of these beds are located on the third floor of our uh, Raritan Bay Hospital. Now, we are providing a specialized care now uh, because we have voluntary beds, we have involuntary beds, we have old age psychiatry beds specifically designated for those, and we also have dual diagnosis or co-occurring disorder beds. So there is a specialization into uh, various types of uh, behavioral health services in inpatient uh, setting. So apart from that, we also have inpatient, uh, big inpatient unit of 81 beds. We have five bed emergency psychiatric services. Previously, we used to call it crisis stabilization unit or CSU. So in the ED, we have five beds specified for uh, psychiatric patients, which is a locked unit. But when we overflow, then the patients are kept in the main ED. Then we have what we call consultation liaison service to assist our medical surgical inpatients who happen to have behavioral health or psychiatric problems. So we have psychiatrists and residents who go and see them and assist while they are probably getting their gallbladder surgery or they're having a um, baby in the hospital. So those people, if they require behavioral health assistance. Then recently in September of last year, we started electroconvulsive therapy, which uh, also called electroshock treatment. Very effective treatment for uh, many, many psychiatric disorders, especially major depression um, and depression with psychosis and whatnot. So we started that and we are developing that service uh, rapidly here. 
Lastly, we partner with George Atlaski Community Mental Health Center, which is located at Lee Street in Pertemboy. It's a big outpatient program. And now uh, we have our own clinical director who is overseeing the administration of uh, George Atlaski Center. So we have outpatient presence in that manner. Then also, we have some near-term plans to further expand the behavioral health services at Raritan Bay. And this is what the expansion will look like. And it is very near-term. It is not something which is going to happen in 10 years or five years. Within next year or so, we will be expanding our EPS, meaning emergency psychiatric services or crisis unit in the ED from five beds to 10 beds. Also, as we talked about on the, in the previous slide, I talked about electroconvulsive therapy. We are adding another neuromodulation treatment, which is called transcranial magnetic stimulation. It is less invasive, but very effective treatment um, with very minimal side effects for many psychiatric disorders, especially depression, which is treatment resistant. So, Within the next few months, we will have this service available at our RBMC campus. Then, last thing which we are thinking of developing at uh, Raritan Bay itself is our own new behavioral health outpatient program. This, we are working in collaboration with Central Jersey Medical Clinic, which is a federally qualified healthcare uh, clinic. So we are hoping to partner with them and develop our own outpatient program at Raritan Bay, which will uh, complement the George Atlaski Center I talked about. So once this whole has happened, this whole thing has happened, I believe that we will have the most comprehensive behavioral health program anywhere in, in New Jersey, especially in Central Jersey, because you may have big inpatient program, big outpatient program, but nowhere you will have almost every uh, treatment modality available from inpatient to outpatient to emergency room to neuromodulation treatment, that is rarely seen in one location and we will have it in very short time. Lastly, this is the last slide I believe and I want to let you know about our resources at Old Bridge Medical Center. We have a brand new four bed uh, crisis unit or emergency psychiatric services in the Old Bridge Emergency Room. Unfortunately, uh, so far our first responders, uh, ambulance and all those, they still have not gotten the message, you know, that we have this service available there and therefore everybody is brought to the RBMC campus. But we are doing more and more education and this is also a part of the same education plan that we inform the community that you don't have to come to a, a Raritan Bay to get behavioral help. help. Uh, because we have emergency psychiatric services in the uh, Old Bridge emergency room. Same way as at Raritan Bay, we also have a consultation liaison practice to assist our medical surgical patients with any behavioral health needs. And we also, in medical arts building, we have a small faculty practice of four professionals, which is called Bay Behavioral Health. So we also have outpatient presence uh, at Old Bridge Medical Campus. So as you probably saw in these three last three slides that we have a very uh, comprehensive uh, behavioral health program at these two locations, which uh, our actually the population at large um, can, can avail uh, the benefits of uh, having these services available to them.